setting up your meeting from Facebook Live. We're four minutes late. That's okay. I'm usually better than this. Redirecting. Check it and see. Should be there. All right, Julie's got it, so it should be on Rusty Chats now. All right. Oh, yeah. It just caught me taking a sip of my beverage. <laughs> Once you two share, we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day. We'll call it a go. Oh. Julie's sharing right now on uh, mine and then, I guess, hers from there, right? Yeah. I I'm good. You got it shared? Boom. Start watch party. Everybody grab your popcorn. Here it comes. Get your popcorn ready. All right. <laughs> what you drinking, man? I have got a, a lemon lime CBD infused margarita on the rocks with um, Luna Zul white tequila, um, Cointreau, fresh squeezed lime, and a little bit of sour, shaken vigorously and frothy over the top. With do, you run, uh, do you run, do, do you do it with salt? Oh, Obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there I see it. I got you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm a no salt guy, but other than that, I love them. And and I got to be careful with tequila. Um, it makes me a little pissy <laughs> if I drink too much. Yeah, we were in uh, we were in uh, Encinitas, California, hanging out with a buddy of mine, and um, we had been drinking Palomas all day. And I forgot them things were full of damn tequila, right? <laughs> so I'm just pounding these bitches. And the next thing I know, I'm in the hot tub, and oh. he's like, he's like, uh, he goes, dude. You are uh, currently arguing with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and put some pants on. <laughs> <laughs> and Julie, and I just was like, Ugh. and I got up and stomped down the stairs and went to bed and she was going to follow me. And um, uh, Al was like, I was like, don't you do it. He knows exactly what he's doing and he needs to go his ass to bed. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sleep it off. I, the only question I would have is, is who won the argument, you or you? You know, I, I couldn't tell you. I think it was a tie. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm drinking. I tell you what, are you guys, um, do you like wine? Love wine. Yeah. So we've been, um, I've been drinking wine on this for the most part, but this is a uh, bookbinder red. Okay. And it, it's, it's through Scout and Cellar. And so Julie and I became distributors of Scout and Cellar basically to help our businesses. So what we, what we were doing were we, you know, Julie would have like these tech connects every quarter. And then we would do a wine tasting and if somebody wanted to buy wine, great, you know, so we, you know, you can make a little money on it, but sure. we weren't really there for the money. We were there because it's all organic. Love that. I mean, it, and, and the lady that, that runs this, she runs them through two vigorous tests. And as long as they pass the test, she buys the entire um, vineyard of, or, oh, or the, wow. you know, yeah. So right. she'll go in and say, I like this. Is it, if this page, she goes all over the world. So we never know what we're getting. Mm -hmm. And we fell in love with this. It's a big bottle. And uh, how much does it cost? About retail? It's 120, but it, it's like two bottles, you know. So 60 right. bucks a bottle, but it is so. And the whole thing with this organic stuff, and you don't wake up feeling like shit the next day. Well, that's it. The, the sulfites are missing. Yeah. And no sugar. Yeah. Yeah. The added sugar, man, is, is, is what'll, what'll uh, get into you. You know what, Russ? I think if you tried really hard, you could drink enough to make yourself feel pretty bad the next well, day. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to say, <laughs> I'm not going to say you don't. Don't be an underachiever, Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, I mean, for the most part though, man, it, it, it's God, it's so good. So we, um, I mean, I'll order stuff a case at a time. I'm like, you know, because it's, it's really hard. And I found out too, that, there's no, there's not a lot of regulations. So a lot of people will call their stuff organic and it's really yeah. not truly organic, but this, this shit is crazy organic. That's awesome. That's you awesome. Know, so um, we've been, we've been really enjoying it. They got um, multi, and, and you never know, you know, of course, as, as it runs out, then, then it's another one, you know, and then you wait till next year for the next That's year right. to come in. But there was a, it's a really good Sauvignon Blanc and we, I, I think I drank them out of the whole damn vineyard myself. Um, well, but anyways, that. it's pretty cool. Uh, so that's what I'm doing, having some wine out here on the on the back deck. Cheers. Gorgeous. Good gorgeous. to have you on here. Yeah, man. It's good to be here. Really so good. we were talking about your crush back there. Or do you play guitar? 
Well, so the guitar you see pictured is mostly a prop. Um, I do happen to know probably a half dozen or more chords um, that I could fumble my way around. But this guitar was actually uh, belonged to my dad, who was a, a lifelong entertainer. Um, and he was, this was his actual travel guitar. So this was the one that he kept in his trunk all the time. Um, of course, when my dad would show up to a party, it would be like, hey, Joe, did you bring your guitar? And he's like, does a bear shit in the woods? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he would break the guitar out and do like a three hour set and he could play to every crowd. You know, if it was, you know, my, his, his mom and dad's crowd, he could do all the 40s, 50s and 60s hits. If it was, you know, his generation, it was a lot of the 50s and 60s stuff. You know, he could jump up in and do like just, just all kind of stuff. So this is his travel guitar that I've been fooling around with most recently. And, um, and so, yeah, that's the story with the guitar. And then of course this crush, um, beautiful art piece here, I was given um, by my love, um, Katrina. And actually this is a song that uh, um, is very uh, special to the two of us. And so it's a piece of art on my wall and behind crush, it's hard to see. However, the lyrics of the entire song are, oh, that's right, cool. are yeah. right here. Yeah, yeah, I so see him. Like yeah, and so yeah, it's I a got... really, really sexy song, and and, and it's uh, Dave is um man, he's 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 amazing. He's I'm a huge fan, as we were talking about before. Yeah, I got to open up for him in, God, how long ago was it? Ninety two, maybe ninety three. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it was a, a great show, man, and uh, I probably hung out more with Boyd and um and uh, backstage Boyd and uh, Carter. I was, a, I was a huge Carter fan. You know, I'm a guitarist and singer, but I played, um, I played drums for two years in a band after I, after I, so I toured for 12. Yeah. And then um, I got, you know, I'm a songwriter. So uh, I got tired of telling drummers how to play my songs. So I was like, damn it, I'm gonna go learn how to play drums. Right? So I, went, I went and bought a kit and took lessons with Donnie Marshall here in, in Charlotte. And he is a fucking monster. I mean, yeah. he's one, he is one of the best drummers I've ever seen. Wow. And I, I hope to get him on here because he's an entrepreneur as a drummer. I mean, that's all he does, you know, and right. um, he's recorded a bunch. Um, so just a great player. And he taught me how to read. Now I can't sight read drums, but his point was, if you can write it out, you can play it. Yeah. So if you hear a lick, I want you to be able to write it. And then I want you to be able to sit and then you can sit there and play it. So, um, and from there, I actually played drums for two years in a band. Awesome. So that was like my dream, you know, and I wasn't a great drummer. I was good at best, but yeah. um, I had a really good backbeat groove and that's really my style. Mm -hmm. uh, and, th and then in that band, they wanted me to the bass player quit. So they were like, you're the only one with the knowledge and the cojones to change. Right. So will you switch? And I said, yeah, man, I'll do it. I was like, but you know, we got to have a drummer that was better than me because I needed work and we damn sure aren't taking a step back. Right. So, th so they brought this kid in, man, that was a, bad ass <laughs> and we rehearsed one time and i was like yeah i'll play with that guy man I so i went and i actually took bass lessons because you know i mean if you know how to play guitar you can play the bass in, in a sense yeah the problem yeah. is is that you, you know i didn't want to attack it like a guitar player i wanted to attack it like a bass player that's right and, and um so and they wanted me to sing more because i was you know i was a vocalist and not again not a great voice but a good voice um, and I could sing and play drums, but they wanted me out front singing. And I found that playing bass and singing was a bitch. Yeah. It's hard as hell. And what makes it hard is that you're, you, you know, drums, you're playing rhythm and you're singing. Guitar, you're really playing rhythm, you know, once you're yeah. up there and you're singing. Mm -hmm. On the bass, you're, you're holding the rhythm, but you're also playing a melody over the song. And then you're singing a melody over top of an of that melody oh yeah so it makes it really difficult and and so i could do it but whatever song they wanted me to sing i'd have to come home and rehearse whereas if they threw any song at me on the other instruments i could just go so it's which, fun which, stuff which makes getty lee all the more impressive yeah yeah really does man and um if you if you you know watching o'till burbage do um his scatting and stuff like that that's really cool but yeah getty's a badass no question yeah, yeah. i'm not a huge rush fan as far as style, but I'm a fan of them. Like, yeah. you know, musician wise, I love them. Yeah. Solid musicians. That's what I love about them too. One of my favorites of all time. Yeah. They're monsters. I'm more of that. Um, I've just been, a, 
you know, Southern soul, rock and roll type thing, you know, Almond Brothers, jam bands, you know, that was kind of my, that was kind of my whole world, you know, that sort of, um, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Well, let me ask you this question. This is maybe a little lesser known band, probably le not less, lesser known to, to me up until about two years ago, um, but certainly a band that if you haven't seen them, you have to go see them because like you were saying before, um, when you see a collection of musicians that occupy the same stage and they're like, and all you can do is just open your eyes and your, your mouth is just hanging open, um, watching the entire thing unfold in front of you and everything else that's going on is uh, Umphreys McGee. Oh yeah. 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 Man. They're great players, man. Yeah. My yeah. buddy Daryl to turn me on to them. It's funny. Um, really good friend of mine here, probably my best bud in, in, in the Carolinas for sure. Um, one day he said, you know, I want to take you to see a band and uh, I'm buying the ticket, so don't worry about it. And, and But you got to come with me because he knows how much I love music. Right. And so they played at uh, the Fillmore and we went down and I'll just tell you, I was just blown away. Absolutely blown away. Never seen them before. Never heard one of their songs before. And for the two hours that they played, I just was just staring, just watching yeah. Isn't the it cool just to amazing. just to run across somebody like that, man? You know, yeah. that's that's when it, it makes it even that much more cool. You know, yeah, yeah. You, going in with no expectations. Um, I went to see uh, a band like Look. They were known, but Blind Melon came out and they oh, had that yeah. damn uh, song um, down, 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 and I no hated rain. it. You know, I hated it. Dude. Yeah, it was just yeah, no rain. Roll with the bumblebee I, suit on. Yeah. Yeah. And I hated that damn song. And so a friend of mine was like, man, they were coming up to play at app. And when I went to college up at app and uh, they were playing the gym too. And I didn't like watching shows in the gym. Yeah. You know? So um, a friend of mine was like, man, I got you tickets, you know? And, and I was like, I don't want to pay for that show. I'm not going. They were like, we're going to give you tickets. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to go to that <laughs> show. You know, anyway, they forced me to go to the damn show and I went in there and they blew my fucking mind. Man. They were, yeah. They really were. I mean, they were great players. They were. They. I mean, it was. It was a constant attack, and they were. They were more of a jam band than I ever thought. You know, they're a midwestern band. But they jammed, man. And I was yeah. like, and Shannon Hoon was amazing on stage. A yeah. uh, great voice, and so uh, they turned. You know, I was. I, and my sister knows them. My sister out in Indiana, she knows them and hangs uh -huh. out with them all because every once in a while they get together. And there's a guy named Travis that sings with them now, and he's really good. But mm -hmm. she told him that story and she was like, my brother hated your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, you know, we get that a lot, you know, until yeah, somebody like, comes uh, to see us. Another <laughs> convert. And, right, and one more. Yeah, yeah, man. Oh, I tell people, man, I, I'm like, I've played in front of 2,500, 3,000 or whatever, more than that. I mean, who knows what all the people I play. And I'm like, and I played in front of two. And I've played in front of two way more than I played in front of the others, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know what was cool too, Russ, and I'll, and I'll just harken back to maybe, heck, it was probably two, two and a half months ago um, when you guys were doing your jam out back. I'll tell you, you know, one of the most healing things for a lot of people was, you know, this whole new reality that we were plunged into. And I say plunged, I, you know, liken it yeah. to like jumping into a, an ice bath. There's just no way to get out fast. Um, and we're still kind of dealing with it. But during those times, um, there was a lot of people that took refuge in what you guys were doing. Um, oh, yeah. And really, and really got back to the things that they were missing. And I'll just tell you to this day, and, and, and Katrina and I talk about it all the time, you know, live music um, for tons of people is just, it's so important. It, 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 and it, and it, it gives you something and it does something for your mentality and your soul and everything else that 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 helps you get through and helps you make life more colorful and you guys did a fabulous job with that so you know at this point i would love to just raise a toast to you guys and say cheers oh, man thanks bro yeah ching ching i had a lot of friends doing it and um and a lot of people would always ask me and you know so after touring all those years i just you know now I'm really blessed in that I get to play when I want to play, where I want to play, with whom I want to play, what I want to play, because I don't do it for any other reason but the love of music. 
Right. And I mean, a few years ago, Mike and I took off, we played about 24, 25 shows in a year. And that was a lot, man. You know, that it became back to a job again. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. But, um, you know, now I get to pick and choose. And so a lot of people were asking, I was like, you know, let's do a Facebook live. Why not? You know, it was weird because you play off of the crowd. Right. And, and I've always been a live musician. I love playing live. That's where I shine. That's what I'm great at. That's that, that being a front man is, you know, I'm a good guitar player. I'm a good drummer. I'm a good bass player. I'm a good singer, but I'm a damn good front man. I really love the crowd. And, um, you know, that, that's where I've shot. It's where I have the most fun. So it was weird because I didn't have any people. You know, I was playing to a phone or whatever. <laughs> and my wife was there. That was it. You know, it was like, you know, but hearing everybody typing in, what's up, play this. And, you know, and then finding out that I had people in Hawaii, people in the UK, people in California, people in Indiana, people in Texas, people in Seattle, people all over watching me. It, it, I was like, you know, wow, because these guys have moved and they don't get to see us anymore. And they really liked my songs and my originals. Yeah. So they were real fans. I mean, these were fans. Sure. And, you know, then I found out that people were having watch parties in their backyards, you know, and putting it on the big screen. And, you know, I was like, shit, you know, what an honor it was um, to, to know that that many people were enjoying it and, and looking forward to it. So, yeah. Um, and I think what I'll do when we do get back out to playing live again, I've decided that I'll put up my podcaster and broadcast it live as well. You know, you I know, think for a lot of the guys are doing that. I think Garth Brooks just did a, a huge drive in theater mm -hmm. worldwide, you know, and you think about the reach of that, you know, we've had technology like this for several years. But and nobody's it's using now it. when we've been forced to use it, you know, we're, we're yeah. a zoom meeting, where, where I would have had to come out to Locust or you'd have to come here to, to Cornelius for to sit down and talk in front of a camera. Now we're still together and very convenient and all that other good stuff. And so um, I was just going to say, because you're such a good front man, I hear that Adam Lambert might be on the rocks with Queen. So you may <laughs> Yeah, I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that guy's skills. Come on now. Freddie Mercury. <laughs> Oh man, no. Adam is out there. You know, I've always loved Freddie. Yeah. But Adam is is his voice is another level to Freddie's, man. No it's, doubt. It's no doubt. It's amazing. Did you watch the special of I him? Did. What an yeah, amazing, you know, and cool. those guys are great guys. I've always been a Brian Mays fan. I mean, I, I've always yeah. loved that band. Well, I was just gonna say too, and Julie probably will high five me on this. I can't, I think the viewing audience is probably really excited about the little white sort of like golf shorts that Freddie used to wear, just nothing else. And just and seeing you on the stage prancing around with those, I think that's going to be fab. Yeah, I got a little bit too big of a belly for that shit. <laughs> hey, ain't no shame in this game, brother. I, but I'll tell you, man, so, you know, talking about the Zoom stuff, well, so this Drinks with an Entrepreneur, which is what we're doing now. Yeah. Uh, probably three or four years ago, Julie and I went, and we went to um, a conference, and, they, and it was, we went to a blogging session, and there was a, a guy there, was, he just blogged. For you know, he was a professional blogger and he and I sat down and we we're talking after, after his seminar. And I was like, I want to do something and I want to call it drinks with an entrepreneur. And he was like, God, that is, I mean, he was like, this is freaking badass. This is genius. I would watch that. I would, you know, you know, the problem was just like you said, I fought through the logistics and the logistics were just, they just wouldn't work out. I was like, what do we do? Do we go to a bar? It's too loud. Right. You know, maybe, I, I mean, I, at one point I was like, maybe we'll go to a brewery early when nobody's there, you know, and they, they're actually not open. And we, we kind of sit there and do it. I thought about that. I, you know, so many different things. Maybe people come out to my lake place. Maybe, but the problem is, you know, you got to drive home. Yeah. Or, you know, or you better have a damn driver, you know. And so we went through. And then... It was you because I come up to our lake pad and you and Julie are doing this. Now I'd already seen Zoom, but you were like, and so what we're gonna do, Julie, is we'll click on here and then we're gonna go right, go live and we share. And, and I was just sitting there going, What? You get to go live? Here we on go. Facebook? Here we go. <laughs> so I literally was like, Holy shit, this is thank you, dude. So yeah. you are the reason, the whole reason why oh, I started doing this on Zoom because I was like, fuck, man, that's awesome. What a great. And I've had some, so far, I think you're the, the sixth person I've had, and it's been fun. It's been fantastic. And, and I think people are learning from it. And I've yeah. had some cool, 
cool, uh, you know, uh, cool conversations, you know, with, with multiple people. On it. One of them was a professor at a university. It's a good friend of mine, a business ethics professor. So he was badass, you know, and, and, uh, but I, the whole time I was like, I got to get Zach on. You know, yeah. I got, not, not just because to pay you back, but you're also great. You know, your shit. And, you know, I thought it would be fun. I thought we'd have a good time. And, and oh, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I can't thank you enough for being here with us, man. And yeah, man. I hope everybody enjoys it. But let me, I, I want to ask you a couple questions um, yeah, let so people rip, can buddy. get to know who you are personally. So well, where are you from? Well, I was born in a hospital because I wanted to be close to my mom. And so that worked out really well. That Smart worked ass. Out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, no, no, all kidding aside, I was born in Ohio. Uh, so I'm a Midwestern boy, uh, Elyria, Ohio, for those that know the, uh, the, the, the suburban Cleveland area. Um, didn't live there for very long. Uh, my dad decided to leave. He was actually a college professor um and an entertainer professional entertainer um he grew up entertaining and was a guitar player saxophone piano all naturally taught uh, couldn't read a, a note of music on a, on a music sheet um but he could literally uh, pick up an instrument and just just handle it and so um we moved to south florida uh he took a job with uh at the at the time was called southern bell um which later turned into bell south and at&t yep. and so on and so forth um lived in south florida until um probably about 1980 and uh, then moved to Atlanta with the, with the job you know that Atlanta is the headquarters for Bell South right and we're there for another five years and then they decided to open up another division or they bought a, another publishing company in the Nashville area so lived in Nashville in the mid 80s for a couple of years and Damn. then back down to South Florida um, where I finally graduated high school in 1989 um the fall of 89 went to college at florida southern which is in lakeland florida um otherwise known as the armpit of satan's hell um beautiful little <laughs> sounds town. like fayetteville north carolina where i'm from <laughs> i'll just tell you i mean i don't think there's any hotter place on the planet the next hotter place would be the sun um and so but but, but a really cool town um Graduated there in 1993, came back to South Florida where I started work nearly immediately with uh, Bell South, but in a different capacity. My dad was at the Yellow Pages side um, and, and I joined the the cellular telephone division, which was called Bell South Mobility. When was uh, this? What year? This was 93. Okay. Yeah. So in 93, the fall of 93 is when I started with Bell South Mobility. Um, started off in kind of a cool spot. Um, Were those those top, big ass... Uh, phones that are suitcase phones yeah so what, what was nice about south florida is because of the topography is very flat and if you know how radio signals travel yeah. they're pretty much linear and so um signals travel very far in the in, in south florida so needing a big bag phone was not necessary the little but the smaller handheld device was 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 workable and so when i was hired there um they were just beta testing a new concept which today would all be like, ha, 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 what is a mobile office? We can do anything anywhere, which is, of course, today is true. At that time, there was no such thing as a mobile office. So what, we, what they gave us was a, a compact, not compact, but compact yeah. UMPA computer laptop. Yep. I remember. They gave us a Motorola PT550, which was the flip phone. And they gave us a little cable that sat between the computer and the phone. It was called an RJ11 jack. Yep. And the RJ11 jack was simply designed to create a dial tone. And so what we were teaching people how to do, and I was one of the first eight people in South Florida to, to, to bring this technology to the world, was is go out and teach people that had fleet sort of staff, people that were out in the field, that rather than needing to go out and do their work and come back and be burdened with a bunch of paperwork or uploading to the system and those sorts of things, or even better, activating certain services or doing things remotely and troubleshooting, we were able to show them through technology how they could do that remotely. And so that was a pretty cool thing. Yeah, and, hell yeah. Um, yeah, and so I did that for about three years and then went into sales management um, and had a team of about 14 salespeople that I shared with another sales manager. And um, about a year after that, I just decided that, you know, corporate was not my thing. It just wasn't my thing. And yes. so I decided to go into a little bit more entrepreneurial side of things. And, and it wasn't long after that that I had, had met somebody and um, we, we decided to get married and, and move to where she was from in the Bahamas. 
And that so had to be then, cool. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. And so we went down in 1998. It was actually Christmas Day of 98. We moved down and um, had two beautiful girls. Um, a little bit later than that, we had about you know several years of no children, um, and had a really cool and fun time down there. Um, got into the real estate business, uh, which I'm currently in. Um, in 2001, it was funny. I was uh, working for a, a small wholesale company there, and um, I took a week off of work to take the entry licensing course for real estate. This was in uh, October of 2000, and uh, took a week off of work, took a you know, paid vacation, and sat the real estate course. Got my license, but didn't activate it until February of the following year. So February of 2001, it was when I started my real estate career. And I have never looked back since. I've always been full time in this business from 2001. So I'm in my 19th year, and next year makes 20. You know your shit uh, about this stuff. <laughs> uh, I'd say um, inside of this gray matter, um, there's, there's <laughs> several several experiences, several transactions, and so yeah. So back in uh, 2015, we decided to make a change um, to come back to the US, my daughters at the time who then would have been 14 and 12, it was time for them to get ready for the next period of their life. And that was the higher education and, and, and so forth. And so we felt like it was a better environment for them to be able to do that, better opportunities. And because I'm American, of course, we were able to do that very seamlessly. Sure, sure. And so um, it was uh, April of 2015. I came up about two months before the family. Um, in July of 2015, I affiliated with a local firm here in the Lake Norman area. And I have been with the same firm ever since and um, rocking and rolling and building a business. I'm doing some coaching now. Um, have the pleasure of coaching a couple of great, great agents, one in Minneapolis, Minnesota, one in Savannah, Georgia. And I continue to build that portfolio with an amazing coaching company, Middleton Elite Coaching. Uh, I'm not sure if Bill and Debbie are watching right now, but they're just literally, um, not only are they masters of their craft and just wonderful communicators and motivators, but they, ge they, they genuinely care about the people that they get to coach. And that includes me. And so it's been yeah. a very long time and I've shared this with them and I'm, I'm eternally grateful um, to be involved with people that really pour into the development of their coaches um, like they do their clients. And so here I am, age 49, just turned 49 in May, um, just having a having a ball with it. Um, and there you have it, man. I I, 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 uh, I paid a coach and, 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 and we'll go back to him. I, I didn't leave him for any other reason than you, you get so much and then you have to kind of pull back and, and implement, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, he... Uh, God, he took my business. We, I mean, he helped me in, in two years. He bumped me almost $300,000 basically with, with what we were going, you know, and, yeah. I, and I've said this multiple times to a thousand people, you know, I had a friend of mine go, man, you're a really smart guy. You know, and I'm like, well, I don't, some people would argue that. <laughs> but he was like, well, I don't, I would never thought you would need a coach. And I said, well, man, who's the greatest quarterback in the NFL right now? I'm just using that as an example. And um, he looked at me and I was like, I'm not going to argue with you. I mean, just who do you think? You know, and he said, well, Tom Brady. And I was like, Tom Brady has probably six coaches. At least. You know, we know he's got a head coach. We know he has an offensive coordinator. We know he has a quarterback's coach. He's probably got a fitness coach. He's probably got an eating coach. He's probably got yeah. a life coach. I mean, you know, all that shit because, you know, just be and, and, and that's why he's the best. Right. It's, it, it's not his full talent. It's because he embraced people telling him that were smarter and better than him how to perfect his, his, his craft, yeah. which is ultimately what I think coaches do, but they also hold you accountable as an entrepreneur. And you know, this, especially in the real estate world, you know, you're, you're not really accountable to anybody. That's it's right. all on you. So I think they hold you accountable. You know, I mean, I, 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 I work out, I have a damn trainer and, and people have said to me, well, how long is it going to take you before you figure out how to go work out on your own? I was like, I, I won't do it on my fucking own. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get my fat ass. That's how I got fat. I didn't get fat out of no. I got fat because that right. working out sucks. That's but right. that man expects me to be there and he holds me accountable. And, you know, my knees were hurting. And I, Julie said I was walking around the house panting because I couldn't breathe. You know, so. I think the coaching thing is huge. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer of it. I think people, um, 
should do more of it. Um, and I, I think that the most successful people out there have them. Yeah. You know, one of the other things too, is when we, when we talk about coaching and again, you're absolutely correct. I think if everybody would take some just basic stock of their current life, um, they probably don't even realize they have coaches. Yeah. And so a coach that a lot of many people have would be a, a faith coach. And yeah. that looks like a priest or a pastor. Sure. Um, they probably have some sort of a financial coach. Maybe it's somebody in their relationship that takes better control of the checkbook, which I'm totally not great with. Or it could be a financial planner. Somebody that sits down with them either, either annually or semi-annually or quarterly and sits down and says, hey, look, here's what we said we wanted to do with your money. How are we looking? How are we doing? What do we need to right. be doing? And so when we think about coaches and what impact that they can have on our lives, sometimes we need to shift the way we look at it. Instead of it being an expense, it actually ends up being an investment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so when you think about, in the, to use your analogy, talking about going to the gym and being fit and disciplined and having, having it in you inherently naturally to say okay russ one more man you got this one more one oh, more yeah and you know what's funny is i call him oh one more yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right that's right because he's like give me one more you got one more you know and that's, that's right. and, and and you would i would have stopped before that one more that's right and it's always the one more that's the difference maker because the red exactly. the other, otherwise that's that's your average and so when we look at that and some of the some of the challenges that sometimes we'll face is thinking about coaching as an expense rather than an investment. And when you look at it from an investment perspective, uh, especially in our business, when you pay um, X dollars, um, if you're not holding your money accountable, um, then that's another challenge as well. So um, yeah, it, it's a huge thing. Uh, and everyone that intends to be more successful than they're naturally inclined to be should have one. Sure. Yeah. I, I agree fully, man. I, I'm a, I, I took Julie and um, I basically said, you know, because I was investing in me and then Julie, of course, was ready to take her business to the next level. And I said, look, I'm going to back off from my coach because I'm, you know, I'm busy. I mean, really? I, I need to implement the shit that he's, you know, I need to sit back and focus for a minute. Sure. Um, but I was like, let's invest in you. So um, and I, and she, you know, she's a tight ass. I'm, I'm, you know, I'll spend the fuck out of some money. You know, <laughs> I'll bitch about, I'll bitch about her spending $10 on some towels. You know, she'll be like, get some hand towels. I'm like, we don't need these hand towels. She was like, it was $10. I was like, we didn't need to spend $10. You know, she goes, you'll go out and spend a damn grand and not even think about it. You know? And, and I'm like, well, that's yeah. But I mean, we needed it or maybe or whatever, <laughs> but I, you know, I did, I said, I said, you know, since I'm going to back off, why don't we invest in you? And he doubled her business, yeah. doubled it. And, yeah. and I remember her sitting there looking at me one time because she's a tight ass. And um, she was like, well, I just don't know if I'm getting exactly, you know, all that. I, I feel like I'm spending too much. Money. So I might back off a, a little bit. And I was like, wait a minute. It was him that got you to do X, which mm -hmm. then took you to Y. And now you're at Z. So you're wrong. You don't need to stop. I mean, keep going yeah. because yeah. you wouldn't have, you would not be here without it. Yeah, and there's yeah. there's a couple of the, there's a couple of things to think about too, and, and I'm sure Julie can attest to this. I've been professionally coached for the last five years. Um, you've been coached before, and, and there's several things that happen. You don't get a coach, and all of a sudden things happen. You get a coach, and they begin to challenge the way that you think about things. Yep, and then they begin to challenge the way that you. Um, how small you might think ordinarily. And then, and, and for me, this is the goal. And, I, and I'll say this, and I, and I believe in it a million percent. There are times when your coach is coaching you and a nugget of wisdom that they drop on you that they might, need, they might not even think that that was so profound. A light bulb comes on inside of you and you're like, had I only thought about that before, and that's when you make these quantum leaps, these huge discoveries in your business and your life and the person that you are. And so, you know, not only do they understand business and how to grow business and how to make sure that you're getting enough leads to, to convert and do all the business stuff, but they've been in it, they've been and experienced so many different things that are that are applicable to many different uh, different fields and whatever else that you actually get these nuggets that will just change the way that you do things. And so when you think about like 
I want to get to this place. All the coaches that I've ever been, they're like, that's not big enough. Yeah. You're, not, you're just not thinking big enough because if we get there, what happens if we get there? Let's think bigger than that. It could, listen, if we don't hit it, that's okay. But we're going to yeah. go for that. And that's where the growth happens. And it's never comfortable. And it's usually somewhat painful because there's a lot of self-examination and self-actualization that happens there. But what a great thing for growth. It, that's if you, if you want to grow, of course. And if you don't, that's okay too, no judgment. But if you're looking to be exceptional and tap your full potential, somebody to help you understand what's important to you and help you go get it, it's huge. John Fox with the Panthers, remember the head coach there, he was like, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. There is no, there's no staying still. That's right. You know, you're either getting better or you're getting worse because, because, because shit passes by. Yeah. You know, and, and, and technology happens, things happen. And if you mm -hmm. don't get out there, you know, I think with me, um, you know, you're talking about those nuggets, but sometimes helping me get out of my damn way. Yeah. You know, because a lot of times I was in my own way. And um, I had a partner and he, he didn't want to grow. I mean, you know, because it hurts to grow and it costs to grow mm -hmm. and it's scary to grow, you know, and in, in the, in the recession, I hired people and people thought I was a damn fool, mm -hmm. but I was like, everybody else is firing people. Mm -hmm. If I hire people, then all of a sudden I'm going to be able to service. And when this damn thing comes back I, and I used to be here, I'll at least be here now. Because, because people, you know, we, we, we think money. about, think about COVID right now. And I was talking to somebody about this, um, who, who, who's fairly new in the world. And I said, we're going to separate the men from the boys or the, you know, women from the girls when this, when this all comes back, when this comes back to fruition. And what, what I meant, I was like, I never sit back and, and wish or hope that someone's going to go out of business. Right. However, shit happens in life. Mm -hmm. and we don't have a control over it, you know. So you, you, you're going to find a lot of people that are going to tank or not be able to make it through mm -hmm. this, and it, and it could be for their own decision. You know, I mean, I don't judge. It's whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't wish it, but that doesn't mean you can't be ready to pounce and grow when it comes. You know, you can't sit back and say, you know, I'm not going to go get this. You know, I'm not going to go out there and get it. So yeah. I look at growth, you know. So when I saw this going down, I was like, all right, we got to pull back. And let's figure out what we can do that when this damn thing comes back, we'll be bigger, better, stronger, faster. You're ready. Yeah, and you're Instead ready. of sitting back and whining and crying in my tea because the governor did this or whatever. Look, I don't have control over their asses. I only have control over mine. You know? right. and, and so I was like, let's go get it. So, you know, and there's still places that are thriving. Yeah. During this, I mean, yeah. if you own a damn hand sanitizer company, you're doing pretty fucking good right now. <laughs> That's right. That's the right. liquor stores were killing it, you know. <laughs> Lined out the door. That's I right. mean, it's like damn, man. everybody was drunk, you know. It's like whatever, yeah. you know. So, uh, but real estate, I mean, you know, when when from what I've seen here, I'm not. I don't know what's going on in New York. I got no clue what's going on in other states, but here in North Carolina, yeah. and I know a lot of real estate agents because, you know, we all network. So we know a ton, right. Right? right? So you guys have been kicking ass. I mean, this, this yeah. is not, this has not set you back for shit, has it? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. There was a, there was a, a brief period of time. I think that everybody at like when March 18th happened, when everybody says, okay, shelter in place, I think for the first week, everybody was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Kind of like yeah. this. Yeah, I mean, I don't got anything to do. I mean, not the boss isn't expecting me or everything right, right. kind of shut down. And this is sort of a maybe our extended spring break and whatever else. And then the next week, people are like, oh, man, uh, this could be problematic. And so there were some dynamics going on in the real estate business, particularly, that no one had ever experienced before. And so there was, it was an interesting thing that happens. And in our business, it's probably similar to yours, Russ, in that you may go in and meet with a potential client. You might assess what their needs are. You may put together a proposal and it may be a month or two before they make a final decision because it's- Sure, in some right. cases, yeah, Whatever. no question. Right, and so, so it's not necessarily a snap, here's the order, go with it. And right. so similar in real estate, you know, the work that we do today, usually the results will show up in 60 to 90 days. And so the, what was happening was, is there was a delayed sort of reaction. Um, the work that many people had done, we saw one of our busiest Januaries and Februaries in the history of our industry, especially in the greater Charlotte area. 
The numbers are astronomical. Generally speaking, January, February, February, mid to end of February, March, ramping into March is when we start to see things really start to light up. April, May, June are usually hot as can be. Summer cools off a little bit. And so there was a seasonality to our business, which in 2019 and coming into 2020 had been somewhat erased. So what we saw in the March to April timeframe was there was a lot of business being closed because it was previously under contract, yet there wasn't a lot of new business being written. And so if you look at the radar, you'd see sort of a blip yeah. as it relates to contracts being written, um, homes going on the market for sale, um, active buyers in the market. And so, yes, you're correct in that we didn't see a ton of a, 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 a change, but what we did see and what we're continuing to see right now is through the end of April and through most of May, where things were still kind of, it was, you could almost liken it to dragging a piano through quicksand. You know, yeah. it's really, you know, you're getting somewhere, but it's really heavy and it's tough and it's, and it's hard to see the finish line. And all of a sudden come the end of May, when things begin to loosen up a little bit, keeping in mind that in this, the general seasonality of April, May, there was this huge amount of pent up demand. And so what happened then all those buyers that were sitting on the sidelines trying to understand what was going to happen, not all, but a good percentage of them yeah. decided, okay, now let's get into the market. Now let's do go it. look for a house. And, and the sellers are like, okay. And so to this day, and we, and we continue to suffer from somewhat of a seller's market. And I say suffer, sellers are loving it. Buyers are getting continually um, less um, excited about the rise in prices. But that, that, that's another story altogether. So bottom line is, is right now things are hopping. Interest rates are historically low. Oh, yeah. Things be crazy low. It's just, it's nuts. Um, so there's still a lot of activity right now. So right now, um, lots of positivity in the market. We still suffer from a lack of inventory. So, you know, if, if you're thinking about selling your home, oh God, it, now's the time to have that discussion because it'll be very difficult to ever enjoy this type of position again. Um, there will be a bottom to the interest rates um, thing at some point. Um, so, but yeah, it's great. The, the market's active and it's, um, again, a seller's market. Yeah, I was a bit worried because, you know, what I was telling people, we were on a lot of uh, already funded, paid for jobs, you know. So um, you, you're going to have to get you another one of those. I don't know who's making them things for you. Katrina, I hope's making I got them this. for you. I got this. But, uh, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> what I was telling people is I was like, I'm solid right now. What I'm worried about is I'm not out there bidding, which is what you were talking about. Right. Um, but as soon as it opened up, man, it was back to it. And we were right at it. And of course, for me as a, owning a security company, when the economy's down, crime is up. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and, and crime's been crime's been going down since 92 heavily. Um, I mean, big time. We're we're. We've been living in the safest times for years and, and people, you know, it's, it's funny because I've had so many people would always be like, God, we're in the worst times in the world. I'm like, no, you're just, you're just hearing news from all over the place. You know, and I remember my grandmother used to say that she would go, I just can't believe what's going on. I was like, me, my, you, you, your, your husband stopped the Holocaust. I mean, there was nothing worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> we're nowhere near that you know but um i think with security systems camera systems i mean all the things that we're doing the police force there you know all of that stuff has, has brought crime down but so i don't we don't see a massive rise but what you see is instead of that's downward error when you see a recession or anything like that you see it flatten a little bit yeah and and that and i think that has to do with you know basically you know, again, economy's down, crime is up. And yeah. I think, and I was, I had, I, I would have clients call me and say, Hey, we're trying to save money right now. So, um, you know, we want to cut off our security system. And I'm like, dude, for $35 a month, this is not the time. Yeah. The <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I was, like, I was like, no, I'll let you out. I mean, cause I'm a, I'm a no, I'm not a long-term contract guy. You know, I'm like, I'll let you out, bud. But I, this is not when I would shut that shit down because things yeah. are getting ready. Could get ugly. I don't know. But um, well, yeah. so, uh, and Julie and I are, are we we were getting ready to build, and um, we found a lot, man. We're so excited about it because it was a fully wooded lot in the country, in a neighborhood, one acre or point nine of an acre, and I was pumped because I wanted a fully wooded lot because that's what I live on now. Mm -hmm. And um, but we we just busted at the seams at this house. Um, so we were gonna build when COVID shit hit. I saw things going down. I was watching the news way back before it really came over here, and I was like, "Yeah, things are, something's getting ready to happen." So we pulled back, 
but as things got, you know, we're still coming back and I know people are pulling back a little bit here and there, but I was like, you know, it's still a buyer's market. I mean, a seller's market and interest rates are low, mm -hmm. you know, um, let's, let's go build. And so we just got our plans finished. So we're excited about that. And uh, I have to approve them now and we'll, we'll move forward. But we're going to build a custom. It's not going to be huge, about less than 2,500 square feet because that's all I want. I was about to say, who gets to keep all that clean and air conditioned and heated? And that's just a place to keep your crap, right? I mean, bud, I do. I've, I've done houses. I did a house that was 20 fucking thousand square feet. It was a mall. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like, what in the fuck? I mean, <laughs> we were sitting there. This is back when I had a partner. Right? And my little house that I have now is 1,450 or some shit like that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's fine. I, I just, I lived low while I continued to build my company. Yeah, but um, I, we were in these people's living room. 20,000. I don't think people have any clue how big yeah. 20 fucking thousand square feet are. No. We were in the living room and I was sitting there. And I looked at my partner at the time and I said, I said, man, I believe this living room, you could fit my house in it. He goes, yeah, oh, all day. And I was like, well, you could at least sat there and did some math for a yeah. minute. You should have to agree with me so quickly. Come on. Yeah, dude. I was like, but their right? fucking living room was bigger than my house. Their living room was 14, over 1,400 square feet. Their fucking living room. That's crazy. I can't imagine why or yeah. what. Or who would buy that? And I mean, I'm not judgmental. It's like, whatever, if that's what you want. But like you said, air conditioning. Could you imagine the fucking power bill on that damn bitch? Well, I mean, there's the other side of that coin. And that is if they're making money and they're that flush, you know, if you if you got a loan on that, the interest is a write off from your income. So there's that. No, I get that. But yeah. still, I, I, you know, how about, but I would, I would have, like have four houses. Or like, I mean, you yeah. eat some hungry children or something. <laughs> I mean, four, yeah. They're, they're I mean, all that anyway. Right. Well, you know, they actually, they were, I will say this, man, they gave back heavily to the community. I mean, it, yeah. this was not, I mean, they were, they were big in the community. They were big at giving. I mean, they, you know, I get nothing like that, but still it's like shit, man. But again, I don't know what that kind of money is. I've never had that kind of money. Um, but I was thinking to myself, four or 5,000 square foot homes instead of one 20,000 square foot home. And I could, mm -hmm. we could have them, but they had other houses as well. But anyway, that's just a big ass house. That's a big house. That's a big house. And but here's my question. So let me ask you this. Uh -huh. um, I was thinking about, um, and I'm still pondering it, but I'm, I've actually shifted gears with some investors. Um, I think we're going to look at building some condos in, a, in the mountains. But um, I was thinking about like a tiny home community. So I've, my little lake place is basically a tiny home, right? So it's a 400 square foot little tiny home, you know, mm -hmm. with a deck and a root. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a nice sure. little pad. Mm -hmm. And so we were, I was, you know, I was thinking about building a tiny home community, but that's, that's an extremely niche market. And, you know, you're, you're selling to less people in that sense. So I'm not saying that's what I'm doing, but what my point to that was, is I believe people are going to, are getting away from these big ass houses, but I'm not a real estate expert. What do you think? Well, it's interesting. And, and it really all just depends on what your needs are. I don't think that we've dramatically changed what and let's say we, the market hasn't dramatically changed what their perception of needs and wants are. Um, we still see people that have, you know, maybe a husband and wife and one child and, and, and another child is on the way and they've got a three bedroom place and they know that a four bedroom is at the minimum is going to be what they need. And so those needs really don't change. Um, people yeah, but, 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 but a four bedroom, you know, or five bedroom, 20,000 square foot home versus a four bedroom, 5,000 square foot home. So I, I'm, I'm thinking in square yeah. footage. Yeah. You know, is, so, so, are you yeah, seeing yeah, people yeah. wanting less or downsize? Are you seeing people wanting to downsize more? I, I don't know. And again, um, it depends on the individual situation. Like if they had five kids and now they're all empty nested, well, clearly that is, there is a, sure. there's a need. And I think that any of the upsizing or downsides or, or even lateral movement is all based upon need, whether it be need in, in size requirements or need in financial requirements or need in practicality. You know, you might see somebody sell a five bedroom, three thirty five hundred dollar or thirty five hundred square foot home and go down to a three two at two thousand square foot and then buy themselves a beach condo. Again, it yeah. really depends on the person. But, but what we have not seen um, is a, a, a demonstrated shift from grandiose homes to small homes 
what we have what we have seen, and, and you'll see this how how housing markets will evolve, um, where certain trends were very popular in, in say the '90s, um, for example. Um, laundry rooms. When I was growing up, the laundry room was always right off the garage. It was wherever, that, that's where it was plumbed and that's where it was convenient, at least supposedly convenient. And then somebody woke up one day and said, hey, what if we put the laundry room where all the dirty clothes are, which would be <laughs> usually upstairs in yes. some closet or, or a, a small utility room. And so that was just like a design element that began to catch on. Another design element would be open plan living. You know, yeah. remember the traditional home where you walk in. Living room, dining room, kitchen. Yeah. Grandma's, you know, living room that had the couches with the plastic. That you sat your couch. ass in at Christmas. That's right. That's and, it. <laughs> and you stuck to it because there was no AC and you got you your shorts on. And yeah, at least that's <laughs> what it was in the Bahamas. Um, and then, you know, so it, now we're talking about, you know, uh, living areas that are very open and very accommodating to crowds and entertaining and that sort of thing. So. Um, but generally speaking, from a square footage perspective, I think the space square footage wise may have trended slightly lower. What has definitely happened is the architect's ability to maneuver the space that was available to make it a lot more livable. And that's what you're seeing a lot in these new years. Yeah. I, I, and when, <clears throat> when we got our plans, it was really cool. Excuse me, my phone. I thought I had it cut off. Hold on one second. Um, <clears throat> when we were uh, working with our our architect or our designer, mm -hmm. you know, he, he was super cool because he was like, you know, he, so he looked at the laundry room, right? Where, that, that, so we had some plans that we thought would we, was something that we wanted, you know, it's like, this is kind of what we want, you know? And he said, that laundry room is too small. And he was like, I wish like hell you could just go poof and put a couple of washers and dryers, but you're going to have to move them. You're going to have to juke them. You know, you need that bigger. And I was like, I, I never thought about that. So, yeah. you know, he, he talked about, you know, I wanted the garage on the side. And he said, so you want one door? And I said, I think one door is fine. He goes, well, when you're coming in from the side, it's better to have one door because then you don't have a pole. You know, so it was some really cool stuff that watching yeah. their eye, you know, them looking at it from a working perspective and or sure. from a living perspective, you know, what makes fucking sense versus yeah. this is what I want. Because a lot of times what you want is, you know, that makes sense. That's right. And they, they, they call that your design coach. You know, people that have lived <laughs> through some of this stuff, right? they've seen the practicality of one design. They're like, you know, what we've discovered over time is, is that this is a much more practical approach to living just based upon feedback and the way people actually live. And so sure. you're seeing exactly. a lot of smart, smart design that way. Yeah. And, you know, I'm working with, you know, and working with the GC from the get go, you know, we talked about, you know, saving costs and, you know, I'm like, where can we cut costs sure. to, to not be stupid? And he's like, don't come in here with some crazy ass roof. You yeah. know, he was like, you know, you know, little things. And it's just, it's always the little things that you don't think about because, so I'm in that industry in, in, in the sense that I'm wiring people's homes, you know, for security, for audio, for video, right. for whatever. And, um, everybody's always way the fuck over budget. Yeah. And I'm like, how in the fuck are y'all over budget? I mean, yeah. you knew what you were getting into. And I think what I've found is that most people talk about, um, one, they, they upgrade where, where they've got a budget for cabinets here. And then they say, Oh, I want the better cabinets or, you know, they got a budget for, you know, um, you know what your your the top of your you know where your sink and shit is and oh, I won't grant it or I want this, you know I think that's part of it because um, I always wondered I'm like are these builders sort of getting you in there and bamboozling you? Um, you know the answer would be yes, yes. perhaps. And, and so what I mean by that is what you do is when you go to a new home community, of course you're going to walk in and the model not only smells perfect, but it's laid out perfect. The perfect furniture pieces are selected. The perfect color schemes are selected. The perfect finishes are selected. Like everything, literally you walk in, you're like, oh yeah, honey, I could see us living here. And then so you go through and you pick the model that you love and then you sit down with a sales rep and they say, okay, well, our standard model comes with this finish. If you want an up, upgrade number one, this is X amount more and upgrade number sure. two, X amount more. And technically you could go in and do a track built home and create either a semi-custom to almost custom home and be on the 
way upper end of the scale of what you'll ever be able to sell that for. So, you know, as a real estate coach, I always, you know, I'm a real estate advisor is what I call myself. I've, I've, I've sure. been an agent for a long time and now I know enough about what I got to do and know how to coach people through this process is you're going to pick the things that are going to pay you back. And the only exception to that is this, is if the home that you're building is going to be your forever home and you want it to be the way you want it to be and you got money like that, then do that. But if you're looking at it, and I, and I always say, you know, whatever you're going to purchase, what would happen if you had to get rid of it? In other words, if there were a major life change, what would you need to do in order to be in the best financial position to make what you needed to make off of it? And so there's some really simple tips on that. You know, kitchens, always a great bet. Now, I'm not saying go with the crazy glaze on the doors and all this other stuff, but do it better than the average and something that you'll be really satisfied and enjoy living in because, of course, you're buying it, you're living it. Um, master bedroom, bathroom suites. Do that up nice. You know, get the nicer vanity with the nicer countertops and the nice you know, garden tubs, if you really have to go for a bath, but I got to tell you, this is a personal opinion. I don't have time to wait for the tub to fill up. I mean, I do not like to sit in my own suck suit. a tub. I'm with you. I've got a garden I, tub in here. And I don't even use, I hadn't used it in fucking 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. You could, you could put goldfish in it for all I care. Yeah. Um, but, but so a really nice spacious shower with maybe a seat, multi jetted thing, something like that. It's not right. going to cost you an arm and a leg. And so when you pay attention to the design elements that the person you're going to sell the home to is going to pay attention to, that's when you're going to make your money. But being careless around, oh, let me get the eight inch stack crown molding as opposed to the six inch standard. Those are things that may or may not pay you depending on the home that you're building in for yourself. Again, right. if it's your forever home and you got to have the stack, go stack, you know, but think about what you're going to be doing for the next phase of your life. I'm going to have this so you time. just you just made me think that you so you we talk about those nuggets yeah right so I was bound and damn determined and, and and I've got friends that do every damn thing on the planet what are you drinking now that is that is not that is not what do you got this is a rose I believe it's called awesome. is this the block and tackle the bl um, no, yeah. or the uh, uh, something French that I can't pronounce. Mont Grave. Mm -hmm. She's doing her best thing. She's trying to help you out there, bud. <laughs> yeah. No, there's a really cool one. We love uh, the from the wine store. It's called Block and Tackle, and it's so great. It's a bit fruity, but nice and dry. It's really, really good. Chris. Yeah, I like a. If I'm gonna do a rosé, I want it dry. But anyway, you just gave me a nugget. So the nugget is this. So I was telling Julie, I was like, you know, whatever we build, we will have a budget. And we, that budget is going to be the damn budget. So mm -hmm. there's not going to be, uh, well, I want this better. I want this better. I want this better. So, you know, but I know cabinet makers. I know HVAC guys. I know window guys. I know. So once my builder gives me what he thinks is going to be my budget, I'm going to go to all these subcontractors that I know personally because I work with them all and uh -huh. say, hey, what, what, what will this cost? What will this cost? What will this cost? But what I haven't done is sat with you showed you the plans and asked you where am I going to win and where am I going to lose? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and because, you know, I, I, do I want it to be my favorite home? Maybe. I don't know. Julie and I may sell every damn thing we have one day and fucking travel the world, you know, and just spin around who knows. Yeah. But I do want to make sure that I have the opportunity to have a sellable something. I don't yeah. now. So forgive me if I'm wrong, but, I don't think you want the cheapest house in the neighborhood, and I don't think you want the most expensive house in the neighborhood. Am I correct in that? That's like simple yeah. real estate, right? Yeah, those are those are some very basic precepts and principles, almost like laws of real estate. They're the law of progression and the law of regression, and they yeah. they're, they're opposite forces. So, to be an average sized home in, in in a in a neighborhood with light finishes and fixtures and those sorts of things will give you the, the best and most likely return. Being the biggest, you're not gonna get it. Being smaller is not bad. Um, you're, you're definitely gonna make up. But again, I, I would plan less for how you're going to plot and scheme a, a getting out of that house and moving to the next place or, or liquidating if you needed to. Think more about just the practical things, being somewhere in the middle, um, yeah. being practical around what you need for your life. You know, right. Like, well, you well totally that. 
But yeah. the, like you said, the six inch finish versus to go up, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I think that that a builder will sell you yeah. on that is it is something that doesn't matter. And you know better than them because you're the one running around selling the house. They're just building the house. So they're making money. Yeah. So I think you got to be careful. And, and so um, we will get together yeah. over uh, lunch, dinner with 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 both ladies yeah, and sling really. the plans and and hear what you have to say. And I'll, and obviously I would pay you for your time, even if you didn't. Offer. But the point is, let me buy you dinner. Let me do it. But I think that's a I think that's a good thing. So anybody building a house, I think, should consult with a damn real estate agent. Well, this is the thing, too. And again, one of the things that, that breaks my heart a lot, and I'm glad that we're, we're going to kind of segue. I feel like we, this is naturally segueing into this. You know, often yeah. people have been a very big misconception in the real estate field. And I know that my fellow real estate professionals will attest and agree and probably be sw you know, swinging the uh, I'm a licensed realtor flag on this one is that for some reason, buyers feel like if they go in without an agent, that either the new home builder is going to give them a break on the commission because they don't have somebody representing them, or I don't have a representative, Mr. Private Home Seller. So in light of that, give me a percentage less off the price because I don't have somebody representing me. And the flaw in that logic is, is as follows. Let me ask you something, Russ. If you had a house for sale and you had it listed with a real estate professional, and you knew that that real estate professional was going to cooperate with another real estate professional for bringing a buyer. And for some reason, a, bu a buyer walked up to your real estate agent and said, hey, I don't have an agent, so I want to buy that for 3% less. What are you going to say? Yeah. You're going to be like, why would I give you 3%? Like, yeah. You don't have an agent. That's your bad. Yeah. Why, why, why do I got to give that money away? But, right. Right. Um, right. Builders are the same way. Builders calculate a, 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 a commission or a compensation program that is included in the, their pricing scheme. So going in and saying, hey, I don't have an agent. Can you give me a little extra off? Why? <laughs> Why? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, but that's the first thing. And then the second thing, and that's just the financial side of things. The second thing is, is why the hell wouldn't you have somebody represent you? Right. They go in and swing the bat for you. Like, hey, what about this? And, you know, you, you sure we can't get that six inch instead of that four inch molding? I mean, we got other places we're looking at. And so why wouldn't you put somebody in the in the game for you to go in there and duke it out a little bit? So that, that's kind of a that, that's the thing that kind of bugs me a bit about what the public perceives as a reality when in truth it's not. It's just, it's just I think I think they just think you guys are making money and they're trying to keep some money to themselves. And it's like. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the big thing is here is the value. What right. is the fucking value of you? Which yeah. is what is the value of me? You know, so when someone hires me, when I get a phone call and they go, well, I just want to know what your price is. I'm like, yeah. look, let me go ahead and give you eight numbers. You call them about a price. I'm not about a price. Mm -hmm. I'm about coming in there, speaking to you and, and taking care of your home, your business, finding out what you need, what you want. And I'm going to build it around that. And then if you want to cut shit, you can cut shit. I don't care. Right. Right. You right. Know, but I'm going to, you know, so I always tell people, I'm going to give you a, a, an estimate or a quote on what I would do if it was my house. Mm -hmm. This is what I would do for me and my family. Mm -hmm. You decide from there what you want to do with you and your family. But here's what I would do. And, and, and it's not, you know, first of all, what baffles me when people talk about money you can't get fucking rich enough on any sale to retire. Never. <laughs> Never. You can't. It's, it, I mean, it's, it, it's impossible. You know, so I'm like, do you really think I'm trying to fuck you over this? I mean, I can't. Right. There's not enough. You can't. <laughs> I mean, unless we're talking about, you know, I mean, even if I'm, if I'm doing a fucking $350,000 job, I'm not making $350,000. You know no. what I mean? And, and, and I, there's no way that one job is going to bank me for the damn year. Just like no one house is going to bank you for the year. But, you know, again, being represented, like you said, making sure that the, the market bears, it's the mm -hmm. right market, it's the right time. I've seen real estate agents who have gone and pulled plots and realized that, hey, you got problems here. Mm -hmm. Before you go buy this shit, there's an issue. Yeah, yeah. you're in you a floodplain. 
You know, yeah. um, you're going to have a restrictive covenant. The roads are, are privately kept and not publicly kept. So there's going to be some sort of assessment that comes along with that. Like there's so many little things that can happen there. And I, let me let me just illustrate something for you because I, I, I this again, this is one of those things that astonishes me. Oftentimes I'll I'll talk to sellers or prospective clients of, of mine and, and they say, well, well I'm going to try to sell it myself. And if I need an agent, then I'll then I'll hire an agent. And I'm thinking, okay. And I and of course, naturally, and this is just a morbid curiosity that I have, is um, what is it about not being represented that scares you? And oftentimes, it'll gravitate towards the commission argument. Well, I have to pay a commission, and so I understand that. And 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 for somebody that doesn't do this all the time, I have to give people some grace on that because it's it's not a thing that you do every day. However, when we, when we probe slightly further and we ask them, is it about the commission or is it about making the most money? Right. And 100% of the time, it's going to be about making the most money. And so here's right. the statistic that I'm getting ready to spit here. And again, stats, again, you know, Russ, num numbers don't lie. Numbers, no. are, numbers are the way we base, our, 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 that we project our income. Numbers are the way that we balance our lives. Numbers mean everything. And so here's the deal. And we know this because we've studied it. I say we, our profession has studied it. The National Association of Realtors has studied the trends. And back in, I want to say 2016 or 2017, and by the way, from that time, we have seen more people actually list with real estate advisors or professionals than they did in, in years past. And so we know this to be true. And that was 2016 or 2017. And the statistic was something like this. And, and don't hold me to the exact number, but it's very right. close. Sure. People that decided to sell their home on their own sold on average between eight and 12% less than they would have had they been represented by a real estate professional. Now, while there is no price fixing and there's no standard commission rate in our industry, generally speaking, very similar to how Rusty Stevens runs his business, there is a certain profit margin that you operate off of based upon what you know your carrying costs are, what your fixed costs are, what your variable costs are, what your tax exposure is, all of the things, your cost of sale and your taxes, then you understand what the net profit looks like. So everyone has a business model based upon what their financial needs are. My business model is generally, and this just depends on the size of the property, somewhere between six and 8% that I would charge on commission, but generally around six to seven. So let's just pretend that you had a home that you wanted to sell for $500,000 and you did it on your own and you took a $40,000 cut because somebody wasn't represented with an agent or you didn't have to pay a commission, okay? So now you're making 440,000 bucks. My math right on that? Yep. No, so, 460. 460. Yeah, 460. 460. So well, give me old math right now, dude, I'm drinking. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So suppose I come in there as a real estate advisor and I list your property and get it professionally photographed. They get all of the paperwork done and make sure that you're legally not exposed and advise you through the process. And then when it comes for somebody to come in and negotiate with you and, and, and try to chip you down on the price or try to use repair requests in, as a negotiating tactic or whatever the things are that will get you to a number and I can make you 470,000. Are you OK with that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit, so you just make an additional rent. ten thousand, and I take it all away from you. Yeah. So this is where the numbers don't—they just don't work. And, and here's what we know to be true. And again, this has been studied. This isn't Zach pulling this out of his ear. This is, and I, and I experience it all the time. I had somebody the other day say to me, "Hey, well, we did it ourselves. We, we were we were able to sell it ourselves." And I said, "Well, I see the number that you had on it, and I just did a thirty thousand foot. Because I, I mean, when you've been doing it as long as I have." I can right. look at numbers and very quickly give you a price range and it's going to land between a percent or two from in that, that space. They sold it for about $40,000 less than they should have, first of all. And his rationale was, is, well, we wanted to make sure that the buyer got a good deal. Now, I don't know what planet you've ever grown up on. I don't know. <laughs> and, I, and I know charity. I know charity. Yeah. <laughs> but that sounded like to me somebody that knew they got caught with their pants down. And the only thing to say at that point was, is, well, I was be feeling charitable. Trying to take and care. I yeah, to I was trying sure to, yeah. Somebody got a good deal. And so anyway, I say all that to say there's, there's these common misconceptions that people feel like they can do it on their own. And they can't. Don't, don't, don't mishear what I'm saying. 
they can do it on their own. The question is, is one, why would you want to try? And two, if you did, you're going to make less. Yeah. Yeah. It's like anything. Well, I, and, and we have the DIYers in my world and, and I've got a damn bullet point of why you don't go with a DIY security system. You know, right. it's all sounds fan. You know, it's all great when it's working. Yeah. But when the shit isn't working, who are you going to call? <laughs> Ghostbusters? <laughs> well, so somebody that, um, that you didn't ask to bid on it for sure. Yeah. Because <laughs> right. oh, I've had them, man. I, I I tell you what, I've had them buy shit, install it, and then call me and want me to come fix it. And I'm like, no. Yeah. That's, it work. No, I'll, I'll be know. there. I'll be there in three months. Well, you know, I, here's what I tell them, and, and I've said this to three different people who have done this this shit, uh, mm. where they went and bought their stuff and then. They really couldn't figure it out. And so they're like, um, will you come over here? And I'm like, yeah, for the price that I initially charged you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because you fucked up and right. I told you, you know, you, you thought you were going to win and you want to do it yourself. And that's fine. I mean, look, you know, I'm not, I understand there's DIYers. I'm not against them. Go for it. But yeah. understand that you can't call me to come clean up your mess. Yeah. When if I would have done it to begin with, there wouldn't be a mess. Yeah. You know? And that's and the look, same thing with you, right? Certain, yeah, certain things that I think that you need to understand and just be okay. You know, I, I did a, a live video, this is several months ago, and it was on the heels of an ex the same conversation that I had with a human being around this. I said, you know, it's okay not to know. You don't have to know everything and you don't have to be good at everything. That's why there's other people around. That's why there's other people that do things that you're not good at. So you're good at what you do. I'm good at what I do. Right. So when you try to be good at what I do, like there's no way that, not that they ever, ever get the chance, but there's no way that they're going to throw me in a middle linebacker on the Panthers for a play. <laughs> it's not going to do it. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because every person on that team and probably 90% of the stadium is going to be better at it than I am. Right. And so why right. even put yourself in the position? Just listen. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is what is wrong with somebody making a living? Can you imagine? I got, I, I, we have people saying, okay, well, will you do it for 5%? And I'm like, well, 5% is 1% less than 6%. But generally, that's almost 17% discount. Yeah. Do one divided by six, and it's about 16.7%. So, what you're asking me to do is give you a 20% offer, right? Yeah. So, let me ask you this question, Russ. If every job you went to, they were like, hey, um, I love what you're doing here, but give me 20%. I know that's a, right. and, and that's your damn markup, you know, so that's you want it. to do it yeah. for free. I told, I, and there's so many people out there and they're, and they're always going to refer the hell out of you. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as I hear someone go, I will refer you. If you give me this break, I'm like, no, you won't. Yeah. And I'm not going to give you a break because yeah, I had to tell a guy years ago, he kept be, And I said, look, do you want me to be here next year? He goes, what are you talking about? I was like, dude, I'm doing your fucking security. Do you want me to be here next year? Well, of course I do. And I'm like, well, then quit beating me up, bro. Because right. you're taking all, you're trying to take all my profit away to give yourself a break so you can go tell your buddies over a beer that you want. Yeah. You know, this has become a fucking competition and I'm over here trying to do the right thing. You know, this is what I charge. This is, you know, and that's it. I'm not, yeah. you know, or, or I don't even week. haggle with people when I want to buy shit. I, I'm not a big haggler. Yeah. If, if, if you've got a good product, and, 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 and I like it and I want it. And I, and, unless you're asking something fucking crazy, but right. if I already know, I'm like, you know what? Done. Sold. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and argue with you over yeah. a couple hundred dollars. And I, I here's an example. I wanted a, a pull behind trailer to pull my Harley in mm -hmm. and do some other things. This guy, I put it on Facebook. This guy comes up and says, Hey, you know, I've got one. I had a $2,200 mindset you know, for a used one, right? We get out there, we're looking at it. This thing's gorgeous. He, he'd used it maybe four or five times. That was right. it. And I already knew what they cost new and the multiple different versions of them new and whatnot. And he, it was, it was fucking nice, man. We're both sitting there and I said, well, it's time to talk about that elephant, what you want. And he goes, well, we were hoping to get $2,200. And I was like, you know, and I was hoping to spend $2,200. So done. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And he looked at me like, 
like I think he thought Fuck, this guy's gonna try to beat me. You know what I mean? And yeah. I was like, you know what? And I probably could have got two hundred dollars off. But you sure. know what? I already knew what I wanted to spend. I was happy with the money. He was happy. I was, yeah. And now I got a friend. We're buddies. That's we right. ride Harleys together because I didn't sit there and try to beat him up over fucking two hundred dollars. You know? Yeah. And you know and that's the point you. we're making here. A, a similar game that you could play is say, you know what? Um, I tell you what, I'll go ahead and give you that discount. If by the time we finish the job or by the time we close, I have two other pieces of closed business from your referrals. I'm happy to do it for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And that I, never. Yeah. Yeah. It well, never well, comes it, to it, fruition. It Hold on. My air condition just kicked on. Give me a second. I'm going to cut it off. Uh -oh. Trying yeah. to shut it down and I'm shutting it down by my phone. Technology. So everybody sees. My alarm.com alarm app. I'm shutting this thing down on my phone from the outside and boom, it cut off. That's one of the things that I do. Beautiful. <laughs> How cool is that? That's awesome. So you talked about some things that um, you said, uh, common myths about real estate when you sent me over the, you know, that, that, that intrigued the hell out of me. What do you, what are, what are some, I'd like to hear about that. What are common myths? Yeah, so we, I mean, we talked about a couple of them, you know, buyers thinking that without representation, they're going to get a better deal and they're going to go in completely blind because they've really not done this before and they don't really have a lot of experience around it. And they're going to usually end up losing and getting really mad about stuff and and that the, the seller's thinking that they can do it on their own. And again, don't mishear me. Sellers certainly can sell their own homes. There's no sure. doubt about it. But statistically yeah, yeah. speaking, Statistically speaking, by the numbers, by the percentages, your they make less of money. Doing it successfully is very, very low. It would be, it would be like me saying, "Hey, Russ, um, that casino there, you can go in and have a 50-50 chance of winning your money, or that casino over there, you can go in and have a 20% chance of winning your money. Which one are you going to go to?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, because that's the reality, right? That's what, right. That's what the stats show, and, and the question is: is are you a gambler? Right. Right. Um, you know, here's another one that I love. And, and, and again, a lot of what we talk about in business, especially in our business, is very competitive. There's a very low bar to enter. Um, if you're able to pass an examination and pay the fees, you can have a license. And so we see lots of people enter our business. Um, I, I was going to say that to you about the part timers, yeah. people that I consider to be the part timers, you know, that, that are that want to be real estate agents, but they don't realize you got to work on fucking Saturday. You got to work on Sunday. These are the, these are the times people want to go view houses. You got to work at night. I mean, it's, it's a damn hustle, bro. It's a, it's a hard job. Well, there's, there's that, but probably more importantly. And so some of the value points I was speaking of before is experience and knowledge. And, and, and by the way, screwing up and failing forward, you know, understanding, Hey, I could have probably done that better or, Right. I made a mistake and next time I won't make that mistake. So there's a lot of that that happens through experience. Um, and so when I talk to people and, and, and they say, well, I've got an agent. And I always ask, not because I'm nosy, but because I genuinely care about the success that human beings enjoy. Is the agent that you've chosen to use in the event you do use one, someone that has good experience? And oftentimes, and again, this is no knock. And again, I, I, I use this phrase a lot. I get it from um, my, my, my coach and friend, Bill. Uh, he says, don't mishear me. I love everybody. You know that. I yeah. love helping yeah. people become successful. You know that. What I, what I care about is when people say, well, I have a friend in the business or I have a uh, a cousin in the business, or my wife is in the business. Same thing here, bud. I'm my so cousin okay can run that wire. That. I'm so okay <laughs> with that. But here's the thing. It's not that you have that. The question is, is do you have the best for that? So I have somebody that I know that's a real estate agent. If we decide at least we're going to do with them. Okay. How long have they been in the business? How many homes have they sold? How many deals have they negotiated successfully? How, how often have they done it? If they sell one home a year and you're just going to use them to do either the buying side or the selling side, you're probably just as good doing it on your own. And I'm not suggesting that inexperienced agents are terrible. Inexperienced agents can be insulated with some really experienced ones and you could really end up with a good experience. 
the thing that bothers me the most is, is that people care less about choosing somebody that deals with the biggest financial thing that they'll ever own, unless they're trust fund babies and they got these gobs and gobs of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The biggest thing that they'll ever get to own and they leave it to somebody that's done one, done it once or just got a license or they've done it for a year and, and sold six homes. And so the question is, is why is it less important to, and Katrina did a beautiful post about this today, um, when you choose a physician, you don't just open the yellow pages and close your eyes and do like this and go, Ugh, I'll yeah. pick that one. Right. You go, okay, well, I have to, I've got some things going on in whatever area of my body. I'm not going to go to the witch doctor for that. And I'm not probably going to go to a general practitioner for that. Although I may do that just for some, like an initial cons consultation and, or send me to a specialist. But when you land on somebody that's going to help you navigate it's such an important thing, you don't just go, well, I'll just take that. You look into yeah. it and you, you care about it. Why? Because it's important. And so the, the question is then is when people decide that every agent that emerges from a school with a piece of paper that says I passed an examination is equal, there's a lot of damage that can be done financially and otherwise. And so that's a big myth. Like everyone that's got a license is great. They're just not. Yeah. So take a little time and do some research. I say interview three, at least three. Why? There's the experience element. And then there's the element of, do I like the person? Like if I got to work with them for the next two months, do I, are we cool? Like, do they hear me when I talk? Do they understand my concerns? Are they going to go to bat for me? Are they going to duke it out for me? And I, and I don't mean to say that every transaction has to be a fight. In fact, I prefer them not to be. It's about finessing relationships. Sure. But, but who are you picking? And so that's a big myth. I, I know somebody in the business, so I'll just use them. Really? Yeah. But, yeah. So and, you know, we, we want them to get experience. Uh, and, you know, we've got plenty of friends that want to do it. Yeah. And it's like, you know, but... But how about, you know, and, and I, in, with any business, anytime somebody comes to me, I'm like, go work in that industry first, yeah. you know, before you think you're going to be a fucking expert, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, I'm not a sales guy, but everybody think, everybody said, oh, you can sell down, you know. I used to ask him. About I used to ask him, you know, and I'm like, no, dude. I'm like, you know, I'm not a car seller. I'm not that guy. I don't, I don't, yeah. that's a different skill. I'm a relationship builder. That's right. And because I give a fuck, you know, I'm not looking for the, you know, I'm not looking for the money right now. I'm look, but I don't get me wrong. I'm looking for the money. So if I sell you a security system, I mean, I'm looking for 10 years of you paying me monthly. I want your damn kids. I want your dad. I want your mom, but I got to do you right first. Right. right. So, you know, I, I care about the people I care about what I do and I want to build a relationship because there's back to what I said before, there's no one damn sale I'm ever going to make. That's going to fucking carry me. There's nope. just not, it's never nope. going to happen. You know? So you, you, you want someone who's going to build a relationship. And I think the thing with me, that's interesting about you guys, um, you know, how many times have people move? Is there a number on that? How many times have people buy? All right. So statistically speaking, um, and this has been slightly modified over the last couple of years, but the last time I think they really did the study that the average um, homeowner would move every, say, seven or so years, give or take two. Maybe okay. Five, maybe nine ish. That's a lot it, more than I thought. Yeah, I think it might, it might have. Been, and again, this is average. Some people move every three years because maybe work takes them to different towns and cities or whatever. And some might sit for 15. Right. Yeah. God bless you, my child. And so, <laughs> and so, once I start sneezing, it goes on. So do a blanket bless, and we're good. Yeah. Or you'll be blessing me thirty-five times. Right. Um, so, so then what we look at is um, what the what the value of a potential client is over the lifetime of your relationship. And so let's pretend that um, God bless you again. Here's a trick I'm going to use. Ready? Blanket. Do a blanket. Cucumber. Hopefully that's it. Okay. Yeah. Go. Um, but yeah, so let's pretend that someone is uh, 30 years old and they're going to buy a home every 10 years, right? So at 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, they're going to, that's three different transactions. Right. Let's just pretend that the average sales price is $300,000. Here's, 
Cucumber. You are too late on that. So three times $300,000, average commission about 3%. That's $27,000. But let's, let's remember that that person probably is also going to refer you one person per year throughout that first 10 years and second 10. So you got another 30 referrals. And let's just pretend that birds of a feather flock together. Right, and right, right. It's almost like, was it was it Prell or one of those hair things? I was telling Katrina about the other month and she didn't remember it. But it's like, and they told, I remember two, they told two friends and so on and so on. And it's, 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 but I guess you have to be a certain age to remember that, right? They did a good um, job with that commercial. You're still remembering it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's one of my blessings and one of my curses is I remember everything. Um, so yeah, so, that, so the, the value of a, of a, of a client is, is ridiculous. Um, and it just, you'd have to work it back on your average sales price, but you know, we're talking about a million dollars probably. And if you do them right and you pay great attention to them and, 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 and treat all of their referrals great and that, and that just blossoms and blossoms and blossoms. It's just, it's crazy. And that's when you can build a really great business. And so I'm glad that you said that. This isn't a transactional business. This is a relationship right. business. You it is. It has in. to be. Yeah. I mean, you're selling. You're, you're you're selling homes. Yeah. I mean, you're selling something that someone's going to live in. I mean, they're they're most like one of their biggest investment number one. Yeah. And their and their most intimate investment. Well, that's. I mean, it, it's a home outside of a marriage. Exactly. But but <laughs> it, it's a home. But 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 it's more than that. It's where their life is going to unfold. Right. That's where the memories are going to be created. And so when we understand what people are looking for, when we ask those questions, you know, what do you want in a home? And we go room by room, like, and then we dig and we dig and we dig. And we ask this question over and over again, why is that important to you? Why is that important to you? And when you get to the very bottom, like when you're digging a hole and you hit the wood box, you've hit the values. And when you're yeah. able to pair values with the property, you win. You yeah. put them in and their life unfolds specifically the way that they designed it to. And that's how you build that relationship. But again, a brand new person would never know that. An untrained, I sell six homes a year person wouldn't know that or how to even do that. It's a technique. It's a skill. It's a muscle you build over time. Well, you got to learn the person, man. You got to build to them. Yeah. We're getting up on that time. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, we don't, I know the shit just goes by, right? <laughs> oh, no. It goes by fucking crazy. Um, it, it, it's nuts. I can't thank you enough for coming on here because. Yeah, man, my pleasure. And I'm excited yeah. about people watching because, you know, everybody's buying, everybody's selling. You know, this, this is Zach Bonsick and yeah. um, you're with uh, Keller Williams, Kel Keller Williams. Yep. But uh, Transcends Real Estate Group. Transcends Real Estate Group. Yep. Transcends was a name I coined about five years ago. And I was trying to design some sort of a name that would give the feeling and emotion of something that was sort of going above and beyond what you might normally experience. And so, and then I threw the Z on the end of it. So it's T-R-A-N-S-C-E-N-Z because my name is Zach. And I wanted to be fun like Zillow or or Amazon or one of those like funky names that made yeah, you yeah, yeah. in your head. So I don't know that I'll ever get that big yet. Um, I feel like it was something that could get catchy if I burn it into your brain now. Well, man, I tell you what, dude, you've been crazy knowledgeable. You've been awesomely fun. Yeah, uh, man, I've had a fantastic good. fucking time. I'm going to have to get Katrina on here at some point. Oh, yeah. Talk to her about her world. I, you know, <laughs> she's she's definitely better looking than you. I've, 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 no I have not met that. her, but I've seen her and um, she's yeah. definitely better looking. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it seems fun, man. It seems, you know, and I'm, I'm glad you're happy, dude. You're doing well in life. It's awesome. And, um, man, I, again, I can't thank you enough. Is there anything you would like to end with real quick? And, no, man, that, and, and, and again, it's not like we're dead on time, but I just think that hour and a half, you know, no, I think that's a sweet spot of, for sure. You know, I mean, I, I feel like we, we touched it all and, and I hope to have you back you know, yeah, yeah. as well. No it's doubt. never going to be, you know, we can get back, we can get you back on and talk more about coaching versus real estate too. You know, yeah. that's the fun part that I think um, we can continue this with. So uh, yeah. anything you'd like to tell everybody or you get know, with anybody or parting thoughts, I would just say, um, continue to follow Rusty. Uh, he's a, he's an awesome thinker. Um, <laughs> and no, and I'm, and I'm being sincere with that. You know, you and I have always had a connection. Um, you know, we think um, very, differently than lots of people. And I don't say differently in a bad way. I say it in a very authentic way. Um, and, and just a general blanket word of advice, um, 
in the in the season that we're coming into and the season that we seem to be hopefully emerging from with the with the pandemic and the election season coming in i would just urge people um be careful what you're taking in and think for yourself yeah just always, be a thinker man. just be a thinker awesome. be a big person think don't let people rev you up take what you see and is it right is it wrong is it good or is it bad? And make some really solid choices based upon your thinking and not what everybody's feeding you. I think empathy, man. I, I you know, I, I feel like we have somehow lost empathy. I, I think that some, I, I wonder if people haven't turned empathy into sympathy, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's like, I don't, have a, don't give you a sympathy, you know, and it's like this, there's so much anger in the fucking world right now. Yeah. And it's like, you know, have some empathy, you yeah. know, and, and realize that we're all fucking humans, man. Yeah. And we're all out there. We got kids. We're trying. Everybody's yeah. doing the best they can do. And don't let the, the world taint that for you. you yeah. Know? And, and realize that, you know, once you get away from all the shit storm that you constantly see on TV or whatever. That's right. And you, and you get back to, I'll tell you this. Part of what I think has, has hurt us during this pandemic is taking us away from each other mm -hmm. because now yeah. there's, there's no connotation to anything we say. Mm -hmm. So it's all about social media and the news, right? right? So we get on social media and we say something without the connotation, without hearing how I said it or why I said it, it could turn into something completely different to the person reading. Of course. And I, I have to, I have to multiple times tell people, nah, that's not what I meant. Yeah. I didn't mean it that way or yeah. whatever. And, 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 um, you know, the human interaction. So what I've been telling people is let's zoom, let's, yeah. let's get to get, you know, if, if we're, if, if we're stuck at home, fuck it, let's do this. Yeah. Because now you you become human to me. But when you're on Facebook typing something, you could be, you know, it's like almost you, you, keyboard warriors. Just get on there and start bashing you. I got called evil today. Evil yeah, yeah. me. I was like, how the fuck am I evil? That's right. crazy because, <laughs> because I don't think the way you, <laughs> yeah. like, evil about me, but okay. You know? But I mean, you know, have some damn empathy for people, dude. You know, yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. So your take is awesome. And, and, and that's my takeaway. From Let's just take, take you know, care of each other, right? Yeah, no, why not, man? I mean, we're all we're you know, and, and and it's not just about America; it's about the world. I mean, okay. we're all humans, man. We're all yeah. good, you know. The majority, the vast majority of us, yeah, are not inherently evil. On that note, my brother, I will cheer. Love you, man. Thank you, brother. My pleasure. Appreciate thank it. You. Good night, Julie. I'll see you soon, and uh, man, thank you for coming on, dude. It was awesome. Can't totally wait to meet awesome. you guys. And listen, I do want to get together and talk about my house. Totally. I'm in. All right, brother. Have a good one now. See you. Peace out.